I am Tom Kirkham. I am founder, CEO, and acting chief information security officer for Kirkham Iron Tech. Apparently, the audiences tell me that the most fascinating thing about me is being an, on, the, on an ISIS kill list. And what makes that relevant to my passion for cybersecurity is I got on that kill list because of a data breach. It had nothing to do with military. It had nothing to do with me being in cybersecurity, uh, politics, law enforcement, none of those things. It was strictly a random data breach that put me on that list in 2015. Many of you, if not all of you, will remember all these lists came out. Most of them were law enforcement or politicians, mostly in New York area, Washington, D.C., but there was one list that was all over the country and seemingly random. And that's one of the lists, that's the list that I was on. I've been doing technology for well over 30 years, closer to 40 now, if you count me starting as a hobbyist. Uh, won some awards as a software designer, author, entrepreneur, and investor in technology all of my life. I've uh, got a couple of books on Amazon. One of them is Hack the Rich. This is about the special needs of high net worth individuals. And the other one is a cyber pandemic survival guide. It's, it's kind of the basics of just uh, properly protecting your company and your personal life. And what's important to realize is neither of these books and nor any other book that I write that I'm working on, uh, they're not targeted to my peers. These are not dry, you know, techno babble, things that, you know, uh, you know, if you're not into technology, they have a fictional component that is evolving over time and it's meant to keep your attention. So I've been told that uh, they're really a great story as well as a great learning opportunity. So anyway, enough plugging. Let's talk about your biggest threats. And chief among those is ransomware. That is, that is a threat that each and every single one of us around the world have to worry about. And we're going to talk more about how huge the hacking industry is, especially when it comes to ransomware. But there's other things that you need to be aware of. It's, it's things like phishing emails. These are emails that trick you into doing things, trick you into revealing your username and password for maybe your Chase account or your City account or your Merrill Lynch, your E-Trade, the list goes on and on and on. Email account, for that matter. Uh, they're, they're just manipulation techniques. You have to worry about drive-by attacks. These are websites, or one of the things is websites that have been compromised. And they trick you into doing things. They con you into letting the hackers get money, get into the network. There's many different things. I suspect that most of you have probably received a pop-up that said your computer's infected by a virus. I've seen it off of weather.com, uh, ibm.com, just cnn.com a long time ago before they secured the advertising networks a little bit better. But it looks like it's from Microsoft. You know, it says, call this 800 number, this Windows Security Center. And what happens is, is they con the user that calls in. They con the user into letting them access the computer. And they show them a bunch of scary things in the event log, which every computer's event log is very scary looking to a layperson. And they say for $299. I'll clean all of this up for you. Well, it never was Microsoft or whoever it purports to be, Norton or McAfee or whatever. They don't monitor your computer. There was never any virus on your computer, or at least as far as they know. And it's basically just getting $299 or whatever the, the fee is to clean the computer up. I have a friend that swears up and down that they really helped him, even though I told him that's a con job. <laughs> to this day, 
he thinks, oh man. And I don't know if he's just in denial. He doesn't want to admit that he was conned, but don't think you're too smart to fall for this. And we're going to talk more about that. We're seeing a huge increase of compromised emails. Okay. If, if you've been using, well, first of all, if if you use an AOL or a Yahoo account for email, you need to get off of it. They've been compromised over and over and over again. But most importantly, I would encourage you to change your password and get a much more secure password, especially if you've been using it for years or decades. Uh, that's the way we're seeing these emails get compromised. You know, they have a, a password you set up back in the days when you didn't really think much about it. Use the same password over and over again. You can't do that anymore. We live in a different world, and it's not going to change anytime soon. We're seeing an uptick in compromised banking, finance, all sorts of other types of accounts, health accounts. And the list just goes on and on and on. There's all sorts of threats out there. I couldn't even name them all if I wanted to. But remember, the biggest weakness when it comes to cyber attacks, your greatest vulnerability is you or your staff. 95% of all successful cyber attacks are because someone in your practice, someone in your home, Someone in a company that you're dealing with, maybe the state of Michigan uh, Department of Revenue, whatever it's called, they let them into the network. 90, I mean, think about that. 95% of successful cyber attacks are because somebody got conned. Even cybersecurity experts get fooled. So don't think it can happen to you. Don't think you're smarter than, than the criminals are because they are specialists in psychological manipulation or, you know, the fancy word social engineering. But make no mistake, it's just a con job. But instead of it being a one-on-one -on -one street con, it's a one-to-many. It's done at volume, done at scale. And the chances are that they don't know who you are and they don't care who you are. And they don't care where you are. It's a numbers game. It's a huge, huge industry, worldwide global industry, by far larger than the global illegal drug trade. So let's talk about a storyline or story time. The story time is the storyline. And the storyline of an attack is an actual technical term. This is a, a, I use this all the time, but part of my job is when there's an attempted breach on us or a client, m the first thing out of my mouth is what's the vector, what's the storyline? That, that, that tells me how did the attack occur, that helps identify who the attacker is, what the nature of the attack is. And so I'm gonna go through the storyline using Joe's, Joe's accounting firm as an example. It could be Joe's dental practice, Do Joe's family dentistry, or Joe's oral surgeon, you know. So Joe receives an email. It looks like it's from Microsoft. It's got the Microsoft logo. It's got the right address. Um, and, and it says something like, there's some s suspicious things going on on your email your Office 365 account, we need you to review it because we're going to suspend access to this account until you say everything's okay. You probably get those for your credit cards, you know? So right there's a click on review sign in. Now in this particular storyline, this is a ransomware attack but it can also be used to steal Joe's credentials and then test those credentials against E-Trade or Citi or a bank, a regional bank in the area. I mean, they, they have automated tools to test these credentials against other websites to get access or your email. 
And once they get access to your email, they kind of have the keys to the kingdom. Okay. So that's, that's why I can't stress enough. Make sure your email is very secure and only use that password in that one place. Don't use it everywhere else. Quit reusing passwords. We know 90% of you, statistically speaking, do that. Even though 60% of you know you shouldn't. And yet you continue to do it. That is a bad security practice. But let's get back to the story. So Joe's convinced that this email is legitimate. And he clicks the link, but it appears to do nothing, right? Like it's a dead link. He gets no warning from his, you know, Norton... McAfee, Bitdefender, Internet, LifeLock, Security Suite. So he just thinks nothing about it. Must not be a virus. It's a broken link. Maybe it is a con job or a scam or, you know, a phishing email. And he doesn't think anything about it. So he goes on about his day, right? But what's going on in this ransomware attack behind the scenes it's going through the entire computer files, all of the data, everything that's in my documents, any other folder that it can get access to, and using what is built into Microsoft Windows or Microsoft Office, and it's if you're a Mac house, you're not immune either, or if you're running all Linux, which I doubt any of you are, it doesn't matter. Windows is simply the biggest target. Okay, it's the most lucrative target for everybody, for all the criminals. What it's doing is it's going through every single file on your computer and encrypting them. And then it goes out on the network. Every place on the network that it has access to, it will encrypt all of those files, including many backup storage devices. Okay. And, it, and, it, and the user, Joe, doesn't have a clue. He doesn't have a clue what's going on. There is no impact on the performance of the computer. Many of you may, may have been advised 20 years ago to turn on disk encryption, and it slowed everything down. That's no longer the case. Computers are much faster. Encryption technology is much quicker. You, you, you see no performance degradation while this ransomware attack is encrypting all of your files. Now, this may take minutes, may take hours. If you have a big practice, it may take days or even, I've never seen it take weeks, but definitely seen it take several days. It just depends on the size of the data that it has access to. And the more data it has access to, the longer the encryption takes. Once again, they have no indication anything is wrong. Then once it encrypts everything it can touch, everything that it can see, then and only then does it announce that all your files are encrypted. Computers become unusable. If it has access to whatever your practice software, Patterson or whatever you use, it's go, it might encrypt the database, especially if your IT hasn't set it up properly. So you really have no way of knowing unless you understand you know, uh, least privileged access to get a little nerdy on you guys. And now the practice is frozen. Nobody can see their appointments. You can't do x-rays. There's just, there's all sorts of fallout from this. You're basically dead in the water. So now what? Well, Joe says, okay, this is no problem. I'm not going to pay the $10,000 or whatever the ransom demand is, which incidentally, is automatically calculated on the fly, okay? This is an automated attack. He says, I'm not paying the ransom. That's not right. We got a backup. I'll just restore everything from backup. If it takes a few hours or whatever, so be it. I'm not going to pay $10,000. He goes to the backups. And lo and behold, they're all encrypted. He looks into it a little further and realizes that not only all the backup files encrypted, but they quit working three months ago because there's no backup system on the planet that works perfectly 
and notifies perfectly when something's failed. And and furthermore, Joe didn't have a policy or procedure to monitor the backups. So now he's dead in the water. He's got five days to pay the ransom. He doesn't own Bitcoin. And, and incidentally, while we're talking about Bitcoin, ransomware has been around long before Bitcoin was even invented. Bitcoin was released in 2009. Ransomware goes back 10 years before that. It's not Bitcoin. It's not the problem. Okay, it's just an easier way for them to get paid. It's frictionless. Transfers instantaneously. In the old days, they had to do it with these, uh, I can't remember the names of them, but these cards, the basically they're credit cards with cash value on them that you can get anonymously from Walmart or, or whatever. That's how they used to do it. So it was a lot of friction involved. But nowadays, it's mostly done with Bitcoin. Now, Joe doesn't understand Bitcoin. He doesn't have a clue how's it, how it works. He doesn't have a hardware wallet like you see there on the screen. He doesn't even have any idea of where to get it. And his business is down until he pays the ransom. And he's only got five days to pay. After that, the data is vaporized. It's no longer retrievable. It's over with. He can't recreate the data. All sorts of things that he's thinking about. It's going through his head. So what does Joe do? He's got a friend that got into Bitcoin five or 10 years ago. You know, you heard these stories about paying $100,000 for the pizza. You know, well, they paid it with whatever it was back, you know, seven or eight years ago. It's a famous story on the internet. If And uh, I forgot how many Bitcoin it was, but it was something like 30 or 40 Bitcoin to deliver a pizza from around the world. You know, the, this guy in Japan or wherever sent it to a guy in Michigan and sent the pizza using Bitcoin. And now it's worth whatever tens of millions of dollars. But anyway, he's got this friend and he has Bitcoin. And I, and I have personal experience with this. Somebody came to me because of a Bitcoin attack, said, I need to buy some Bitcoin. Uh, so he goes to his friend. He says, here's the address that you need to make the payment to. Here's the, here's the five or $10,000 in cash. Go ahead and uh, make the transfer. So his friend transfers the money with his phone, payment complete. Now the hacker begins unencrypting the files. Then Joe discovers that in his state, and in fact, I think it's true for all 50 states, you've got to report these attacks. And you often are required to report it to clients. Remember, you guys have HIPAA regulations you've got to think about. Now clients begin to leave or patients begin to leave. You know, if they can't trust you with their health information, their credit card data, uh, that's a hit to your reputation. And I have left accounting firms that's been compromised because of that very thing. And if it happens to any vendor that I use, any doctor that I use, dentist, florist, as far as that goes, anything, any business that I do business with, if they get compromised and my data has been released, I'm going to leave them. It's that simple. There's too many things that you're going to learn to prevent this from happening. And what you really need to know, statistically, 40 to 60% of businesses go out of business within two years of a successful attack. Now, you may think, well, this is over with now, right? You know, hopefully Joe survives or whatever. But what's really happening is these patients are leaving. Now he's got to lay off employees. What he doesn't know is he's now a mark. Patsy, he's going to have more attacks if he doesn't change his ways. I, it's unbelievable how many new clients that we get that only after their second or third cyber attack do they finally decide to do something about it and to prevent it going forward. Furthermore, 
let's say Joe stays in business. He keeps his practice alive. He gradually builds up his client base. All modern ransomware attacks have multiple payloads. It's been this way for years. So if there's anyone listening that's had a ransomware attack in the past and your network wasn't forensically examined by a cybersecurity expert or an infosec professional, that's what we call ourselves in the business, guess what? There's server backdoors, there's key loggers on workstations, there's all sorts of other malicious things on your network that may take weeks or months or even years before another kernel specialist picks it up and starts exploiting the vulnerability that was planted on the device. They always have multiple payloads. We have never gone into a new client that's had a successful attack in the past that we did not discover other malicious items. And what you need to know, especially when it comes to antivirus, because I don't know if we have that in this slide deck. Oh, incidentally, it's the first time I'm using this slide deck. So congratulations. Uh, it, I forgot my thought now. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, but at any rate, um, it, it, they have multiple payloads. So you've, you've got to examine that network forensically by an expert to make sure there's nothing else there because you're not out of the woods. Maybe Joe goes out and puts these other things on there and then he discovers them. Wow. That's a close call. I'm glad we found that out. So how did Joe fail? He didn't understand the risk to his firm. Now, each of you that are on here, you're hopefully going to leave this understanding how really truly huge this industry is. This is no longer an industry where it's done by a teenager on the sofa in his mom's basement doing it for bragging rights. This is a multi-trillion dollar global industry. If you add up all the money paid out in ransoms, you add up all the loss of productivity cost, all the money spent on defense, all the money spent on offense. We're seeing criminal gangs now on the dark web. That's where all the bad guys hang out. We're seeing them complain now about administrative headaches problems with HR, problems with scaling their criminal enterprise. But the very first step is understanding your risk. And Joe didn't do it. Maybe he thought it only happens to the big, big guys, you know, the colonial pipelines, Sony Pictures Corporation, JBS Meat Supply. You know, it's impacted everybody at some point or another, right? You've had a doctor's office or a hospital or, well, everybody's been hit with, uh, who was it? Uh, one of the big three credit reporting agencies. That affected everybody. Got to understand the risk. And generally speaking, um, it, it there's a lot of things from a management and a leadership perspective that failed to protect the firm or the practice as well. Joe was relying on antivirus. You know, antivirus detects viruses. It's a 30 plus year old technology. It's no longer adequate. And I remembered my train of thought because this is exactly why antivirus is no longer effective. About six or seven years ago, our own Nationalist uh, Security Administration, who I've sold software to, the NSA, was breached. The very same Stuxnet virus that the United States and Israel and other, um, other allies used to destroy the centrifuges in Iran's nuclear enrichment facility was stolen from the NSA, along with the source code. And many other cyber warfare tools have been stolen, not just from the NSA, but other uh, nation states as well. 
And these these uh, weapons, they truly are weapons. They are designed to evade all sorts of detection methods. A modern-day ransomware attack and many other types of attacks will just blow right past this 30-plus-year-old antivirus technology. It's simply not adequate. And they get these tools, these cyber weapons, for free off of the dark web. They don't have to pay for them. When they stole the NSA tools, they tried to sell them for, I don't know, thousands of dollars. And uh, they, they had no takers, and they gave up, and they finally just said, well, here they all are. Joe was not monitoring backups. And he didn't make sure that the backup was ransomware proof. There was no cybersecurity awareness training for his staff. This goes back to that 95% number. 95% of attacks are because of human error. And in this case, it was Joe. Joe had no training and he had he provided no training for his staff. And part of best practices of properly securing your practice is to use a cybersecurity professional. And I want to make a point here that there is a difference between an IT specialist and a cybersecurity specialist. It's a different uh, it's a different experience set, it's a different skill set, it's a different approach and it has differing objectives. Okay? Your investment in, in, in IT, your, your IT investment is there to make your practice more productive, more efficient. It's designed, that investment is there to increase the bottom line, increase top line revenue, revenues. It positively impacts your practice each and every single day if you're doing it right. It's not really an expense. That's an investment in your firm. When it comes to cybersecurity, we're talking, at the, we're talking about preventing a fatal cybersecurity attack on your firm. We're talking about stopping HIPAA fines or any other regulatory fines that you may incur. We're talking about the very survival of the firm. If it's effective, it will always be in an expense. But if you're thinking about it from a visionary approach and you're thinking about the future of the practice and you have very successful practice and you're going to you're going to turn it over to someone else that there's an inherent value to that practice. And especially if you're getting close to that point in your practice to where you're thinking about oh here's a 30 year old he wants to take over an existing practice and all of a sudden you get hit with a cyber attack all that a lot of that value is just going to vaporize it's going to go up in smoke so getting back to the storyline let's talk about this from the hacker's point of view now the lead or the mastermind of this particular ransomware attack the hacker themselves is a specialist in psychological manipulation and all of those other things, social engineering and conning people. He relies on other criminal specialists to provide encryption and de-encryption servers. He relies on other criminal organizations to provide clean email servers. He hires help desk services from other criminal organizations. So the victim has an 800 number to call. Okay. The victim has an 800 number to call. I don't know how to get Bitcoin or I paid the ransom, but my files aren't unencrypted. They've got an, a help desk to help them unencrypt the files. And there's other criminal organizations involved. Once again, it's a huge industry. There was a, uh, a couple of masterminds of a major ransomware attack 
that they grossed three and a half billion dollars worldwide on one single attack. Three and a half billion, that's with a B. And looking at all the research with the Bitcoin wallets, because in spite of what people think, Bitcoin's not truly anonymous. Um, it appears that each of the two mastermind netted $300 million a piece. That other almost $2 billion or $3 billion, or I guess about two and a half billion, whatever the math is, uh, it paid all of these other criminal organiz organizations that provide these other systems or these services, these systems as a service or email as a service or help desk as a service. I can't stress how big this industry is. Now, his email list, maybe he has an email list of everyone that's a member of the state dental society or dental association. Maybe he's got the whole ADA list. It's done at volume, at scale. He's using a piece of software to construct the attack that another criminal organization developed and sold to him. It's point and click. He doesn't even have to know how to write code. He just uploads the email list, tells the software where the encryption server is, the address of the mail server. Here's the 800 number and it plugs everything in. All he does is next, next, next. And then it says, when do you want to send this? email out to these 100,000 recipients. Once again, he doesn't know who you are. He doesn't care who you are. What he's thinking about is getting a conversion rate, maybe a conversion rate of just 1% out of those 100,000, yeah, those 100,000 potential victims. That's 1,000 victims, right? And let's say all 1,000 pay the ransom. And let's say the average ransom is $10,000. He just grossed $10 million for about a week and a half worth of work. Rinse and repeat. Take a little vacation in Greece, Hawaii, Florida, Sicily, I don't know where he's going to take a vacation. Probably Greece. That's where they seem to pick. That's where Interpol gets a lot of them. You know, they leave Russia and go to Greece. I, I don't know why. Uh, but it, it's a big payday. And after he takes a couple of weeks, a month or two or three or six, does another one. Or he does a bigger one. It's a huge, huge industry. And it just, just don't think it's personal. It's not. The ones that you hear about on CNN, you read about in the Washington Post or wherever you get your news, those are the big guys. Those are targeted attacks. There's more attacks to small businesses that, than that's the most of them. That's the majority of them. It's over half of them. And I actually think that's what the statistics tell us is 50% of them roughly are to small to medium-sized businesses, but I think that is low. I personally know of many small businesses that never reported their breach. It's embarrassing. It creates devaluation of your, your lifetime investment for most of us, right? Why would you report it? Take the chance. So I think it's vastly underreported. So... I mentioned this earlier, no matter how smart you think you are, at the very least, coincidences will likely fool you. And I personally had this happen to me. We do, and, and we're targeted, okay? We are highly targeted. They invest time, money, and energy into figuring out ways to target Kirkham Iron Tech. So we're always on the guard. We're a whole company full of experts, practically. Some people do other things besides n the nerdy stuff, but you know, most of us are experts at this. Well, one time I just happened to be working on my Google security settings. And, and our company simulates these phishing emails, these attacks to see and test us 
to see how everybody's doing, see if everybody's on their guard, see if everyone is treating security as job one. I got one of these simulated phishing attacks. Hey, your Google security settings click, have changed. Click here to review them. I blew right past all my training. Didn't even think twice about it because I was in the middle of working on them. I clicked on the email and I get a two minute training video on everything that I knew better that I shouldn't have done because it was easy to catch, but I just blew right past it. So don't think it can happen to you. There's only one person in our entire company that hasn't failed for one of these simulated phishing attacks. And obviously it's not me. That is the only one I've fallen for, but it's embarrassing. But there's something else happening. And it's, I guess it's about the biggest buzzword there is right now. You know, I mentioned that it's done at scale. I mentioned that they don't know who you are. I mentioned that they're using a email list of 100,000 or a million or 10 million people or whatever they're doing. And now what we have to worry about is AI. What you're going to see, and I'm already seeing it, is gonna, the hackers are going to use and are using AI to do targeted attacks, okay? That means someone on your staff is gonna get an email that looks like it's from you, and it's gonna try to fool them and con them into letting them onto the network or to send them Apple gift cards or to give them access to your uh, bank accounts, do an ACH transfer, whatever the con is. Now with AI, they can automate these attacks. Kenzie's on the call our whole, uh, in our Hawaiian, our Waikiki office in Hawaii. Kenzie, we've gotten two or three that look like they're from her doing things that are very suspicious, but very relevant. It looks like it's, they're coming from her and they're going to people that would report to her, asking them for information or getting, trying to con them into doing things. And AI is going to allow that to happen to very small companies. So remember that 95% in the past, we're going to start seeing this go up to 96, 97%, 98%. Because in the past, if your practice wasn't targeted, it's going to, it's not going to be personalized. It's just going to be like that email that I showed you in the storyline. It looks like it's from Microsoft. Now it's going to look like it came from you. So why should you care? Well, these are obvious. We've already talked about most of these. Uh, we're seeing more and more compliance requirements. You guys are already experienced with this with HIPAA, and maybe you have other compliance requirements. We're seeing insurance companies require compliance for you to have the right protection in place, or they will not write you a liability policy or a cybersecurity liability policy. But it's also coming from the Federal Trade Commission. You're already having to deal with PCI, or at the very least, having to explain that you're exempt from PCI requirements when it comes to handling credit cards. Even a minor attack can cause productivity losses or revenue losses. Minor attacks can interrupt bill payments, making payroll. Everyone has to worry about releasing client data, obviously the HIPAA part of it, but more importantly, we're seeing class action lawsuits of businesses and practices from their clients because of a data breach. So now, you know, you're, it's not just HIPAA. It's not just the Federal Trade Commission. Now you've got to worry about your actual clients, your customers, your patients getting together and suing you. And I already talked about that. A few other statistics. Cyber fatigue and especially apathy, this feeling of hopelessness 
you know, it seems like there's a, well, there is a breach literally every day, I, probably about every minute of every day, maybe more. You know, there's thousands of attacks a minute on our company, literally. That's not an exaggeration. They're automated attacks, just trying to find vulnerabilities. But statistically, it's about 42% of all companies, large and small, Everyone has this apathy. They don't know what to do or they're tired of hearing about it and you just give up. You just hope it doesn't happen to you or somebody you do business with. And, and that can be fixed. Cybersecurity awareness trainings for everyone. You got to be aware of it and you got to treat it as job one. Getting back to the difference in IT and cybersecurity expertise. And I'm surprised by this. But yet, I know this number is higher, but what the stats tell us is 54% of companies are reporting that their IT departments are not sophisticated enough to handle advanced cyber attacks. Anecdotally, personally, this is more like 90% that don't even know what the best practices are, what the best technologies are to defend against an attack, much less stop an actual attack. And my peers agree with that number. It's a different specialty. It's nothing wrong with your IT. You remember that IT specialist, many of you probably outsource your IT, or most of you, they're there to increase the profitability. They have a different objective. And you just think about the pace of change. You know. Being a Luddite was mentioned earlier. Um, just think about the pace of change in technology. Well, now add cops and robbers, geopolitical dynamics, cyber warfare to the mix. The pace of change in the cybersecurity industry is much higher than IT itself. It's higher than, in, than technology itself. So I contend that that stat is way low. And just to beat you over the head again, <laughs> it's human. Human is actually on my shirt, by the way, it's <clears throat> security. Um, here's something else to think about because I like to talk about benchmarking. Okay. Uh, Rosenberg survey shows that most companies, and, and this is actually the business you're in plus professional serve other professional service firms. Uh, the proper budget for both IT and cybersecurity together is about $5,700 a year. Uh, and it doesn't really vary by the firm. So you've got to identify your industry standards. Different industries have specific requirements and specific standards that they have to meet. Your, your dental association may have some. If they don't, they will. It's inevitable. We all have to get together and do these things. But at the core of it, it's all based upon best practices that the cybersecurity industry established 20 years ago and continue to refine it. So law firms, you've got, at the very least, rules of professional conduct. You guys, I'm sure, have ethical requirements as well. And credit, anybody that takes credit cards, which is everybody, but the list goes on and on and on. Do you know automobile dealers have cybersecurity requirements now? They can't just rely on antivirus, or else the Federal Trade Commission is going to come in and slap them with a fine. It wouldn't surprise me if the FTC starts regulating a number of industries. And some of you may be saying, well, why don't, why doesn't the U.S. government do something? You know, why can't they stop this? They have limited tools at their disposal. 90% of the cybersecurity budget of the U.S. government is spent on offensive war cyber attacks, offensive weapons not defensive weapons. Furthermore, the scale of the criminal part of this industry, or even the nation state, North Korea and Iran, both of them sent out ransomware attacks because 
periodically they need to raise U.S. dollars to buy goods and services on the black market because they have sanctions. Russia, too, for that matter, the nation state of Russia, not just Russian criminals. The, the, we know how to defend against these. these. This is not my opinion that you need to do this, this, and this. These are best practices. Anyone in the, in the cybersecurity end knows what to do. You need to look for what's known in the in our business as a mesh security service provider. And they don't have to be local. You know, it's not a boots on the ground. In fact, our monitoring literally around the world, not just Hawaii and not just our people, but all of our supporting vendors are literally located around the world that do monitoring and responding investigations. It's it's things that can be done remotely. So besides the specific entry standards, these are kind of the it's one of this is one of them. It's known as the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. NIST is National Institute of Standards and Technology, part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. NIST is based upon other international standards. Other international standards are based on NIST. All dental associations or associations or accounting societies are all fundamentally based in these international standards. I think that the standard. I'm not going to make a cybersecurity expert out of you guys in an hour. No more than you can make me a dentist in an hour or an oral surgeon or you know pediatric dentistry specialist. I'm just trying to give you this 50,000 foot view of what you need to know to look for, right? So I'm not going to go on this because there's a lot to it, but there's five key components. The first step is identifying. That's where the risk assessment comes in. You've got to identify and acknowledge your vulnerabilities. Understand them. The second is now now that you know where your weaknesses are, let's do something about it. Let's put in security awareness training. Let's make sure our backups are ransomware proof, and let's make sure they're functioning each and every single day. Put in the right protective, the right defensive technology. Then you've got to put in an intrusion detection system. That's automation and manual, human beings. InfoSec professionals to respond. The response system has to be both automated and manual. Remember, you've got to investigate every single security event by an InfoSec professional. And then finally, the fifth component is you've got to have a recovery system. No defensive system is 100%. If, it, if all of them were right, the NSA never would have been breached. The objective is to take your practice, your personal life, whatever. We need to take that from 10%, 15% in any given year that your firm will be breached, your practice will be breached. We want to implement these international standards and best practices and best in class technology to drive that risk down to 0.01% or 0.001%. There's no guarantee that your house won't burn down. Your office won't burn down. Same thing with cybersecurity. There's no such thing as 100%. Now, we're fortunate that none of our clients have had a, an attack. And I wish, I, I mean, I, it's realistic for me to say that that's probably going to happen for a while, but not forever. I know that. We're just trying to low that, lower that risk down. You guys do that every time you, you're doing your practice, you're doing dental work. You know, every single patient, okay, well, this looks pretty good. I've done everything that, uh, that's best practices and using the best techniques, best technology and everything like that. But there's always risk, risk of infection, if nothing else. Same thing with cybersecurity. We just want to drop that risk down doing the right things. Now, I mentioned benchmarking and budgeting. 
So this is a good rule of thumb. And let's, it, it's really like about six to 14%, depending on the industry or the areas of specialty and a lot of other things. But let's say you do a million dollars a year. And, and you know, this probably, it's probably high for a, pra a dental practice, but uh, it's not high for a law firm. About 10% of the annual budget or the annual revenue, about 10% of that needs to be spent on IT and cybersecurity. And of that, 10% of that entire budget needs to be spent on cybersecurity. Or you can use that $5,700 per employee number as well. That's the right way to do it. These are benchmarks. Anytime we talk to prospects, we look up and see what the benchmarks are for their industry. And if they're under that benchmark, we're not patting them on the back. It's like, great job. You're underspending. Okay. That's not the first thing we do. The first thing we think of, what are they missing? Now, if you can get away with spending 5% and you're doing all of the right things, good job. I, I mean, we're not, we're not here. We're not in business and, and no MSSP uh, is, is there to sell you stuff you don't need. I promise you, I promise you. They've already made an ethical decision to be the good guys in this business. But our first alert is that they're not spending enough. And it may be on the IT side because that's an investment as well. So the very first step, and oh, and by the way, please throw your questions in chat, or I guess we can open up the mics and we're gonna have a couple of minutes here. Uh, but our, our objective is to, to get that assessment done and understanding what your security gaps are. Now we often also do general IT, you know, see what your IT infrastructure looks like and other parts because, you know, that's smart too. But when we just focus on cybersecurity, this one scored 17 out of 100. Got a bunch of red boxes here. That means that they don't have good password management. They don't have any security awareness training. They don't monitor the dark web. They don't use two-factor authentication. That's fine. At least you know the state of your practice. Now, let's fix it. Let's do that step two in NIST, cybersecurity framework. It's it and Tom saying that. It's not Kirk and Iron Tech just trying to sell you a bunch of stuff. This is best practices, international standards. I can't stress that enough. And let's get all these boxes green. Now, it's expensive running these types of companies. We have to buy very expensive software to monitor, manage, respond, coordinate with teams, or orchestrate, as they call it in the business. And it's no longer do it yourself. I hope that I've impressed upon you that it's going to be the exception to the rule that your IT company is going to be experts at this. So I'm not saying they won't be. And I'm also not, once again, don't think I'm dissing on IT. I've been doing it all my life. But many years ago, I decided to be get into cybersecurity and I understand the differences in it. Uh, I did software design even before that. So. And, but what we're seeing, regardless of the company size, it's simply a best practice to outsource it. We have companies worth tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that outsource to us, even though they've got an IT staff. Even the, in fact, the good IT people understand that they aren't experts because we work with them all the time. They're actually relieved that they're not on the hook in case of a breach. You remember the Colonial Pipeline incident? Um, interrupted petroleum distribution on the east, eastern seaboard, I think from New York. Oh, I know it went to Florida because I was visiting Florida about three weeks afterwards, and they still had gasoline. They had still had gas uh, lines at the gasoline stations. Um, they They were targeted, but they had no idea that they were targeting petroleum distribution. They actually apologized for it. They still wanted their four and a half million dollars. 
But one thing about the criminals is they don't want to be on CNN because they want to rinse and repeat the attacks. They didn't have a chief information security officer at Colonial Pipeline. By all reports, the CIO was very skilled, an expert at IT, did a fantastic job. I did an investigation of that about a day or two after the news broke on it, started looking into it. And the very first, you can find the videos on YouTube. Uh -huh. Very first thing I thought, they don't have a security officer. Well, two or three weeks later, they started searching for one. The CEO said, we need a security officer. And now what we're seeing is all of these companies, and hopefully your practice will realize that you don't need to think of security as an add-on to your IT. You need, to use, you need to think in terms of making IT, IT management, an add-on to security. That's what I mean when I say security has to be job one. This will aid you into really, it, it's, a, it's a mind shift, okay? okay. And it'll improve the chance of your success to properly defend your practice. Okay. Tom, mm -hmm. hi, it's, it's Matt again. Yes, sir. Um, you can hear me. Um, there was a couple of questions. Um, one is, will AI, especially chat GTP, mean extra precautions are necessary? Um, and um, the other one is, is cloud storage backup more or less secure if, um, if you're using cloud storage? So those are, those are two of the two of the questions we have here at the end. Right. Those are both great questions. And, and I could spend an entire day on AI impact on cybersecurity, on just cybersecurity. Um, here's the good news about that. Except for the security awareness training part, all of the technologies that we put in place, these best in class tools, policies and procedures, the administrative controls part or governance is effective against AI generated attacks as we see today. But I would especially, you know, we have a reluctance on the part of most of our clients not to get security awareness training. They just want to rely on the extra money they're spending on technology and, and our services. And that's disappointing. Uh, I think it's going to increase the need for security awareness training, period. That's it in a nutshell. But of all the things that are out there, all of the stuff that we've been doing for years is, is going to be affected from a technical standpoint and a procedural standpoint. So uh, the only extra precaution I see today is just seriously consider awareness training. And as far as cloud storage backup, more or less secure, I want to enlarge this a little bit because some of you may have been told by your service provider, maybe you virtualized your practice and everything's in the cloud and you attend a session like this and you call them up and you go, hey, I'm really worried about cybersecurity. And you're told something like, well, you don't have to worry about that because it's in the cloud. That is an absolute falsehood. The only difference between a cloud computer and one that's in your office is location. Now, there are different security vulnerabilities sometimes in cloud-based technology versus on-premises technology. Uh, but don't take that for granted. Right? Don't, don't accept that it's more secure because it's in the cloud. That is absolutely untrue. I've seen, I've had friends that are big insurance companies that were told that, and they ended up, they, their service provider had a breach that affected many other insurance companies around the, uh, the country. Learn the hard, the hard way. Now, getting back to the specifics of the question, as, as far as cloud storage backup, more or less secure, uh, it's more secure. Generally, it's a best practice. When we implement backup technologies, we usually use two or three different technologies, procedures, and uh, other practices, depending on the need of a backup, because there's three things you got to think about on backup. You got to think about data backup and how quick it is to restore it. 
Then you've got to think about disaster recovery, which means a catastrophic loss, either through a cyber attack or a natural disaster, floods, tornadoes, earthquakes. And then you also have to think about business continuity. How expensive is it for your practice to be down? How much does it cost your practice every hour or every day that it's down? And then that, that, those three considerations then drive the right ways to do backups. In most scenarios, you need both on-prem backups and cloud backups. There's timing issues and obviously the reason for that particular type of backup. Almost all of our clients have multiple backup strategies. Okay. Um, listen, that's, that's great. Um, we appreciate it. We've got, um, we've got our hour and we appreciate you, Tom, coming on.